الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين <coughs> We have been addressing the needs and the issues that would help us as a community raise a great Muslim generation of leaders We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to do that This is the most serious mission for us as a community living in this country. It is not important how many of us fill the mosque today. What is more important is how many of our children come to the mosque. Think about it. All communities who migrated into this country ended up melting. Melting in the global sense. Melting in their faith, in their religious practice, in their relationship to their culture, in abandoning their original languages, in the way they lead life only according to what is expected from the larger society, not according to their faith or their culture. We are bound to reach where they are if we do not make sure that our children fill the masjid when we are alive. It's a challenge, it's a very serious challenge, but this is the only way we can raise a Muslim children, let alone a great generation of Muslim men and women, which is the task at hand. So we need to understand that our children are not only taught by us, we are not their only source of information. We have lots of competition. If we do not beat the competition, they are going to beat us at getting our children the way they want. I'm not saying that the society is evil, far from it. All what I'm saying is there are forces in our society that are very destructive for our children as they are for all children. Those who promote drugs in school, guns, violence, preteen sex, you name it, it is out there. Those are the forces we are talking about that can and do impact our children. Being out of school in a different culture makes us unfortunately blinded from what is going on in the schools to which your children go. Our children go mostly to the public school where philosophy and culture shape their heads, where their friends shape their hearts, what you like, what you don't like, what you should like, what you should not accept. Besides all of this, they lack the direct spiritual guidance from any source other than their parents. You are their only window into Islam. We spoke last week about the importance of designating time for our children on daily basis if we want to raise them as Muslims, let alone a great Muslim generation. Today, I'm going to take you through a list of items that we need to look at. For any generation to stand the challenges of its opposite environment, they have to be a powerful generation. 
So what are the sources of power for our children? Where do they stem their power to stand against negative trends, negative direction? With what, is, what is the power that they have? One of the things we learn is that children at young age, when they start speaking, what is the first word they pick from home? What is the first word? No. Right? Which is the power to object. Where do they pick it from? They pick it from mom and dad. Because many of the things they try to play with or touch are dangerous. So they hear the word no so much that it becomes their first word in their life ever. The word no. We need to understand where this word is coming from and how important it is to protect themselves and their character from being either oppressed or destroyed by the power of adults around them or others. This word has been so much despised for parents because they take it seriously as if the child calculated and is saying no, which means no. The child is young. As when you object, you tell him no. When he wants to object, what does he say? He says no. He's objecting to what you want him to do or stop doing. We need to nurture in our children the ability to object. But with it, we have to teach them what to object. Why? Because they will live a life in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ Some of you would say, but they are young. You're talking about young children. Object to what? Whatever they want to object to. Tell them to object. When they are young, they are unable to sort things out. But they still need the power to object in their life. Because if they do not get trained at young age to say no, and when to say it, and how to say it, and when to use it, and again, it's what should they use it, if they don't learn all of this, they will go to school, and their power to object is trimmed out. It's cut out of their vocabulary. Don't you ever say no. No, I want my child to start saying no whenever he feels like it. Until he reaches an age to learn when to use it and how to use it. But this power is his power of pushing back. We spoke last week about the pushback mechanism that Allah instituted as a sunnah and a law in any human society. <coughs> Many of the people have told us it doesn't take much corruption to corrupt a society. It only takes the silence of the righteous ones to let corruption grow. So they don't have to be the majority that are corrupt. Very few societies have the majority that are corrupting. Maybe a good majority could be corrupt, but to corrupt others, it takes a few to get the corruption out. All what we need to do as a society is to push back against what is harmful to our society, to our nation, to our community, to our children, and to our faith. We spoke last time about Islamophobia as a force and a power that is pushing against our existence. They try to delegitimize our faith. Some of them said that this is not faith, this is a political belief. This is a political system because Islam has a say in society and social issues and political issues and leadership issues and values. They want to classify it not as a faith with the privilege that is accorded to faith communities. They want to exclude our community from that. A few weeks ago, I got a video uh, into my inbox for the president of the Liberty University, right here in Virginia. 
talking to his students and the, the stadium was packed. There's not an empty spot. And he was telling them, is it legal to get what I have in my pocket here? Pointing to his back pocket. And apparently he had a gun. Or so he made the impression. He said, I don't know if it's legal, but I want to encourage you, telling his students, to get yourself a gun so that those Muslims, if they come in, they found us ready. This is not Islamophobia in idea. This is supposed to be illegal. I can assure you that everyone listening to this here will say, what happened to him? He's not a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. So he can say and do anything. Just imagine if a leader in any Muslim community would make a similar statement. How much attack will you get? Not only as a speaker, but everybody. But the reaction should not be that we are a peaceful community. Nor is it supposed to be violence for violence. Our reaction should be to teach others about our faith. The same students he was addressing, I am sure some of them, if they learn Islam as is, not as thrown at them, they will be free from where they are. They will not be hostages to such hate speech and violent speech. So all what I'm saying is, those kids at, those, at this university, they are at the age of our own kids, right? If our children are present and they raise their hands and they speak up, the environment will be different. The response will be different. But the kids in the auditorium were clapping and screaming and happily responding to the call. I believe our kids need to know where they are living and what is going on. CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, just issued a, a statement, a lengthy statement, assessing the position of Islamophobia in America. And they said Islamophobia at, uh, triggered attacks against Muslims have risen up to 76%. In one year of the Trump administration, and you know what I'm talking about, from pulling the scarf of women to refusing to give a right to a Muslim in a cab, so many other things. But those are not the big issue. But if we let those fester and grow, it will go to what the university uh, president was telling his students. And if we let this one stand and don't push back, they will do what they promised to do. I'm not trying to scare anybody, but these are things that are running in our life, and unless we prepare our children to stand with their faith and educate everybody around them, how do they compete in the marketplace of ideas? So, when the Prophet ﷺ says, خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه. The best amongst you are those who learn the Quran and teach it. When Allah subhanahu wa taala tells Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وجاهدهم به جهادا كبيرا. جاهدهم به أي بالقرآن. Use the Quran to push back against. Those who hate the Quran because they don't understand it. Those who hate Islam and hate Muslims. So our role in looking at the issue of raising a better and a greater generation than our own must center around the Quran. Because it is the greatest gift Allah has given mankind. Concealing it or concealing any knowledge that Allah gave us is a crime. Do you know what the punishment of this crime is? The punishment is, فَإِنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ 
those who conceal the knowledge from people who need it and need it badly, the punishment is they will be cursed by Allah and angels and by people. Who would stand this kind of curse coming from all directions? When we conceal the Quran, we are abrogating our own responsibility. We are abdicating our responsibility. We are canceling our mission in life, which is to be mercy to the world. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ the vast majority of us send our children to the public school because we cannot, all of us, afford expensive Islamic school tuitions. But we will be able to afford it if we all support all Islamic schools. But if only the parent who has a child in the Islamic school is the one who's going to have to pay the full cost it will be prohibitive. It will be prohibitive. So we need to think of ways. We've built mosques. We donate for mosques. And we love to donate for mosques. And we should continue to donate to maintain and grow the number and the size of mosques to accommodate the numbers of Muslims we have. Which is only, we are only accommodating 30% of the needs of people for a space for prayer. So we need two more, double, two-thirds more of what we have. Two times more. But Islamic schools, where the Quran is taught, where the Arabic language is taught, this is empowering for our children. So how do we talk about raising a great Muslim generation when none of our children attends Quran classes? So let alone the... Uh, the, the full-time Islamic schools, they are not affordable for many of us. What about the weekend schools? What about those of us who do not send their children to neither one? Not the full-time, not the weekend school. When do your children get exposed to the Quran? How could they be a great generation that is disconnected from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Those questions are important to ask, and they are important to answer. And we need to figure ways to provide real, practical answers to those questions before we talk about raising a great generation. It's a nice motto to adapt, but what we need is not a motto. We need practical steps to that end, raising a great Muslim generation. So if we empower our children with the Quran, the Quran will tell them how to answer Islamophobia, how to answer aggression, how to answer violence, how to answer attacks, how to deal with the desire for conformity in their social circles. It will teach them that man in this life is one of two. Any human being is one of two. You are either a leader or a follower. There is no third place unless you count yourself out of the human society. And when you are a leader, you better know where you're taking yourself and those who follow you. Don't mislead those you lead. We have the example of Fir'aun. يَقْدُمُ قَوْمَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ He goes ahead of his people on the Day of Judgment. فَأَوْرَدَهُمُ النَّارِ He took them into hellfire. بِئْسَ الْوِرْدُ الْمَوْرُودِ So I should not follow any leader, no matter how popular that leader may be. That value needs to be transmitted to our children, that they should not follow anyone that becomes popular. Because whom do they follow in their school? Popular kids, Right? High, you know, profile kids, kids who speak up, kids who create trouble, kids who play like macho, young men and young women, kids who show power and impression on others. We need to tell them 
they should follow their values and anyone who lives by their values. This is the choice. But when we, the adults, are acting and reacting in a knee-jerk reaction and action, we do not give our children the real role model they need to follow. We have to teach them that you don't pick anyone to follow who is not following the model of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the only one that Allah told us to follow. Follow him. فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَاتَّبِعُوهُ قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Follow me. Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell us to follow him. Our children do not know that. So they end up becoming followers of anyone who either looks nice, sounds nice, looks funny, sounds funny, and those are becoming their own leaders. Their generation's members of Congress are going to be their peers. They are not going to come from heaven. They are going to come from the society. Why not them? Because if they are nurtured, the sense of helplessness, because they are a minority, they will feel helpless. And they will feel protected in following others, whatever those others may be. So if there is a gang in their school, or if there is a bully in their class, they will stand behind that bully to be protected. Because you don't stand in front of a bully. But if we teach them that they should stand for their values, to protect themselves and others, and speak up against bullying in school, and if we do not support them to stop bullying in schools, they w there will be bull bullies in schools, and they will have to oblige and respect them. So we need to empower our children. And the first source of power that we have and they have is the Quran. The Quran will give you the faith. The Quran will give you the vision. The Quran will give you the guidance. The Quran will give you the power to love and the power to push back against those who want to do harm to you. When do we teach our kids those values? It's only if we have time for our kids. And if they have time for us, because many of our children now, especially young generation, they are too busy with electronics that parents have no space in their time. Who gave them those tools without teaching them what to use it for? It is us. Don't blame what you give your children that grabs their attention and divorces them from your life. If we are asked a straightforward question, do you want to divorce your children from your life? Of course not. Do you want your children to divorce you? Of course not. Do they actually divorce you when they get stuck with the iPad and the iPhone and the i this and i that? Do they divorce you? Of course. You cannot call them to take their meals. You cannot call them to sleep. You cannot call them to study. You cannot call them to listen to you. They will not have time for you. So those of us who have younger children, less than five years old, I want to give you the bad news so that you are aware of what's going on. A recent study has shown that children who are exposed to electronic stuff at young age, it damages their brain cells. Should I repeat this? Is this the first time you hear it? And the damage in children is much greater than the damage that also happens in adults. When you use your phone next to your ear, the microwaves that run from the phone to the tower and the opposite are very damaging. In fact, there is a conference in the United Nations that will be held around this issue 
what legislations should country have so that cell companies reduce the amount of radiation that cell phones and electronics radiate into the brains of people, young and old. But our children who are using those tools, they are innocent. They don't know what harm is coming to them. I was told by uh, a staff member here that our staff, the few that we have here working at Dar al-Hijra, started to forget things that normal people should not. And I'm not talking about my generation, I'm talking about the younger generation. I'm talking about 30 and 20. They go to the office and say, what did I come here for? Forgetfulness is an effect of extensive use of the cell phone. The study also says that it doesn't only damage if it is put in your upper heart side pocket. Even if you put it in the pant pocket, it also will damage your you know, productive organ organs. It does damage. But because we cannot live without it, and we have to carry it. Women who put the phone in their chest, they damage and it causes breast cancer. It's the same study. So brothers and sisters, at least we should protect our children from harm if we cannot take their hands forward to what is beneficial. At least, as doctors will tell you, the first thing you learn in medicine is do no harm. A patient comes to you, don't make his situation worse. If you can't treat him, at least keep him as is. Our children are harmed by things that we give them. Whether it is, what are their priorities? Oh, we want you to do well in school. That's the first priority. So we wake them up for the school, but not for the Fajr. What is the message? The message is school is more important than prayer. And then we want to fight the school to allow them to pray Zohr when we didn't fight ourselves to put them early in bed to be able to wake them early for Fajr. We have to be consistent. We have to admit our faults and accept responsibility. Our children is our future, and the future of this nation. They are part and parcel of whether or not they will be led or they will be leading. So if you like what you get from people who are leading the country, if you like the direction where we are heading, if you like our foreign policy, domestic policy, if you like the messages that you get from politicians to this society about Islam in particular and Muslims, Leave things as is. But if you want to effect a change, you have to bring a generation that knows what it needs to do. And the first step is to connect our children to the Quran. I'm going to stop here because I want this message to sink and take its time to sink. We grew up without the Quran, most of us. And most of us started to commit to Islam at older age, whether it was 20 or 30 or whatever age. And you see, we are weaker than taking a stand against anything that is harmful to Islam and Muslims. Our next generation will be the same if they do not connect with Islam early on in their life. Any human being needs to connect to something that constitutes their center of gravity in their life. If it is the Quran, Alhamdulillah. If it is not, whose responsibility is it to bring the Quran into the center of lives of our children? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to do the right thing. <coughs> 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 
الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد The Quran is not a book that is meant just for memorization when we talk about Quran and children we all remember my child remembers this my child memorizes that Memorizing the Quran will help the child or the adult recall and read the Quran without having to refer to a book. So it's another addition of a book, but it is the Quran. Very important. And it's a great blessing to memorize the Quran. But it is a greater blessing to understand the Quran and to live by the Quran is even greater than just understanding the Quran. We always say that the Quran has barakah. Just let him memorize it. And the barakah will be all throughout their life. Do you know what the barakah term means? The term barakah and barakah means blessings. Do you know what blessings are? Blessings come in the form of either knowledge that saves your life, food that nurtures your body, values that control your campus and direction. So we have to know what barakah is. Barakah is not the presence of a book called the Quran on the shelf or on the dashboard in my car or even memorizing the Quran in my heart. The benefit of the Quran is the barakah of the Quran. So if I don't use it, I don't get the benefit. So there is no barakah. There is no barakah. What is the barakah in money? The barakah in money is when it buys you what you need. Right? When it's used to protect you, to advance your cause, to protect your health and to feed your family and to grow your business. That's a barakah of money, right? When it helps you be charitable, generous, and a good donor, whatever you are, whatever the cause is. But if you do not use your money, but just save it in the bank, what barakah do you get from the money? So barakah is benefit. And benefit is only the result of using what you have. If you don't use it, it has no barakah. As the example I always give, which is when you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes for you medication and you buy the medication and you put it in the medicine cabinet, but you do not use it, what barakah do you get from the medicine? Do you get any barakah? No. So the barakah of the Quran, the blessings of the Quran is to use it. So if I run into a problem and I know where to look in the Quran, the Quran gives me the barakah, the blessing of the knowledge it has, the guidance that Allah offers me. So the barakah is not in the pages of the Quran. The barakah is in using the Quran to live by it and to guide myself according to its guidance. And khayrukum Man ta'allama al-Qur'an wa'allama. The best amongst you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. Our children need to know what is the barakah of the Qur'an and how to use it, not just how to memorize it. And for those of us who do not know the Arabic language to help their children read the Qur'an, learn Arabic and teach your children. If you can't, for whatever reason, bring your children to a teacher or bring a teacher to your children where they can learn it. Because it is the greatest source of every great thing, including raising a great Muslim generation. They will never be great away from the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Quran the spring of our hearts. اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلوبنا وشفاء صدورنا وجلاء همومنا وأحزاننا 
اللهم علمنا منه ما جهلنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم اجعل القرآن العظيم شفيعنا يوم نلقاك اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن واجعل أبناءنا من جيل القرآن اللهم فقههم في الدين وعلمهم التأويل اللهم اجعلهم هداة مهتدين غير ضالين ولا مضلين اللهم خذ بأيديهم إليك أخذ الكرام عليك اللهم خذ بأيدي أبنائنا وبناتنا إلى طريق الصراط المستقيم اللهم فقههم في الدين اللهم فقههم في الدين اللهم أمين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب وأقم الصلاة